so rooted in the valley and so connected with my hometown, uh, I started being self-critical of my own work, and I noticed, yeah, those particular homes are finding their way into my own writing. Kind of this chance meeting in a hallway with this guy that uh, graduated just two semesters later, right? And got me on this kick, if you will. So uh, I'm, I'm going to start from the bottom, right? And we're going to talk about cultural home, and we'll move our way up. Because the two bottom ones are actually the ones I'm most familiar with. These are the ones I grew up with on a daily basis. These are the ones that kind of become ingrained without us even trying. And the two top ones are the ones I had to study a little bit more. And I'm still studying, I should admit. Okay. So, I mean, how, how do you define these things, right? Um, cultural home, I mean, what, what makes up a culture? You know, and I can pitch that back to you guys to do the back and forth. Uh, you know, obviously look at me, food's one of them, yeah? Uh, so food is definitely one of those cultural things. Uh, language being another one. Uh, in my own realm of, you know, Antonito in my hometown, my family, religion is another cultural aspect, right? Some, some people might equate that with the mythical, but to me it's uh, synonymous with my culture. Right? So those three play a humongous role in how I view the world and how I right, and the different things that I try and convey, right, uh, as we're bringing uh, a poem together, as I'm trying to construct me. Uh, there are other aspects of culture, too. I mean, can you guys think of some others? I mean, because we're going to look at, at a few as we, as we move through. But those are the three principal ones in terms of my own writing. Yeah. Any ideas? What some other cultural, uh, so we have language, right, like I mentioned, religion for me. We have food, of course. Art, family. Yeah, family and art, right? What's that? Music and art. Music, right? Our different ways that we experience and express ourselves. The land. The land, okay? And the land, of course, has historical value, too, right? And so those things become part of almost every poem I write. It's kind of like a, a default button for me, if you will. And uh, so as I become more and more you know, understanding of what a Chicano is, I discover, well, it then becomes my duty to protect that cultural home. It is something which I feel is under constant threat. And I ask my students pretty much every semester, you know, define themselves culturally, or what are some of the cultural things that you do as a, as a human, as a family, wherever you're from. And they say, oh, things like the Super Bowl, I'm like, maybe that's a cultural event, but like, what, what about your heritage? What about those things? And like, sometimes they don't even know, right? And so some of the challenges to that cultural home, right? What are the things that are uh, trying to knock down those walls? What are the things that are uh, the termites, if you will, threatening that particular home? Things like assimilation, uh, things like language loss, which is a component of assimilation. Uh, just plain old shame, right? And where you're from or who your uh, friends are or what your community is and looks like. Those are, to me, constant threats, right? So my goal in protecting that cultural home then becomes something pretty, pretty simple, actually. To find beauty in a culture which other people think is less than beautiful. To find beauty in a place where people think that maybe it's even ugly and or not worth saving. Right? And I guess you can apply that to all four of them. Right? But those are the cultural things that I try and round up and save constantly. Right? And then we move up, right? What sort of historical markers you know, do we live our lives by? I mean, what sort of history do we inherit? Right? So being who I am and where I'm from, uh, on one level, right, I'm constantly bombarded through school with this history of conquest. You've done nothing but lose. Right? From water rights to land to language, you have this history of being conquered. And every book that I had read pretty much my entire life reaffirmed that. Right? So as you begin to look at what are some of the ways that you can look at history, how does Atzlan, this mythical homeland, 
exist in a historical place. And it's one of the slides I wanted to show you. And it's one of the things I wanted to point out. So let me get out of it real quick. So I don't know if you can see that, okay. It's purely a depiction of a, the southwestern United States. And it's this mythical Chicano homeland, but it's also a historical homeland, right? And if you're reading some of the codices about Aztlán, there's different ways that it's described. But one of the depictions of Aztlán is that it come, it's a place where there are cranes that come in the spring. And it's a large lake surrounded by high mountains. Right? And you can look at all these different areas, right? And you think about the geological history of this place, and if that description of Aslan is even remotely correct, you can honestly say that it is this valley, right? And so history tells us, you know, that this all used to be Mexico, and that with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Mexican-American War, that all of this was lost. And to a certain extent, that is absolutely true, right? But look at all the people that were in all these different areas, and all the language, and all the history, and all the different culture that was displaced, right? And that history of loss becomes kind of ingrained, and it becomes sort of this uh, cancer, if you will. So the historical aspect of Atzlan is to reclaim a people's home, to understand that that place existed and that it is a place to return to. It is a place that kind of fulfills you, regenerates and rejuvenates. Am I making sense? Yeah. So uh, Atzlan becomes this actual and literal place, a historical place, that you can actually go back to and see where things begin, the origins. Right? And then we move up, right? So then we have this mythical place. And the mythical place is, well, it's our myths. Right? Who are these gods and goddesses, and what do they mean to me, having been removed from me and or not even familiar with for centuries? Right? So I'm studying these different homes. I'm just devouring Aslan and them. <clears throat> finding these different uh, Aztec deities, you know, uh, Quetzalcoatl, this plume serpent. I'm like, who is Quetzalcoatl? And you read that he is the one who created humans, that he sacrificed his own blood, that he went into the underworld and he mixed his blood with the bones of giants and from that sacrifice sprang human beings. Us, right? And then you find out that he's a god of life and you find out that he's a god of education and he's a god of knowledge. Anything. Wow, that's something that I would uh, like to call myself, not a god necessarily, but a person of knowledge, right? A person of light. And, and then you find about a Tezcatli Puaca, this, uh, this other god, a uh, smoking mirror, right? who is a god of fate. And that your fate is a subsidiary mirror and it's clouded with smoke, right? You can see where it is that you should be. You can see who it is that you... Uh, want to be, where you want to be. But there's this cloud of smoke, you know, this bit of darkness, and you have this darkness and this light, and you have these forces kind of at odds with each other. And in Aztec mythology, Tezcatlipoca and uh, Quetzalcoatl are at odds with one another. Right? They're kind of a uh, little angel, little devil type thing, if you will. Right? The good and the bad. Not the Tezcatlipoca. Tezcatlipoca is bad, but that he's uh, more cruel, shall we say, more honest, right? Mm. And he shows us who we really are. And correct me if I'm wrong or disagree if you like, I, I mean, that's kind of part of the deal, right? But sometimes we don't like what we see when we look in the mirror. Sometimes we try to deny who it is we really are. And I think that's one of the things that I've, I've become aware of, that 
as I'm studying and looking, and I'm talking about when I was an undergrad and I'm looking at these things, I'm like, wow, I was ashamed of who I was. I was ashamed of uh, where I was from. Uh, my idea of success was to run as far away and as fast as I could. And I realized that my fate was inextricably linked to the place I'm from, to the things I've learned. And I realized that the solution to what you know I perceived as problems, what I perceived as being the negative aspects of my life, that the mythological actually supplies the solutions to so many of life's problems. I think the most, uh, I mean, maybe the most uh, obvious example that maybe we're uh, all familiar with is Pachuco, right, from uh, Luis Valdez's Zoot Suit. Right? He is Henry Reyna's alter ego. And Henry Reyna in the Sleepy Lagoon uh, murder trial, their, their lives are placed in jeopardy, right? They're in peril. And it's at the height of World War II, and the Zoot Suit riots have happened. You have all these Chicanos on trial for a murder they didn't commit. They're all tried together. Right? They're not allowed to take showers. Uh, every time their name is called, they have to stand up in court. I mean, these are not depictions of Luis Valdez's imagination. These are historical facts, right? So how does Henry Reyna escape that? Well, his alter ego, the Pachuco, this Aztec deity, is his guide. Tells him how to navigate and uh, survive. And at the end, right, Henry Reyna, he tells Pachuco, he goes, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly, but he says, we learned a new way to fight, I said. Right? Because they won the court battle. And this is the era of, uh, of, of Hearst newspapers, right? And the play has all these multiple endings. I don't know if you're familiar with the play or the endings. There's multiple endings for what happens to Henry Reyna. And multiple fates. One of them is he dies of a heroin overdose. Another one is that he finally goes and joins the military and is killed in action in Korea. Another one is he gets married and raises Chicanitos and still fighting the fight. Right? Multiple ideas. But Pachuco, this mythical person, saves him. If we wanted to relate it to, the, to Greek mythology, I mean, who is it that's always saving Odysseus? If not the gods and goddesses who's always guiding him home, right? So the, the myth is this teacher. The myth is what teaches us how to conquer and or circumvent or at least deal with the obstacles in our lives. Is this making sense? Everybody still good? Yeah. And then we move up, right? And, and I will be honest, the archetype is the one I'm the least familiar with. It's the one I'm still struggling with. Right. In the literature sense, that's you know the abuelita. That's an archetype. The curandera, an archetype. The chicana, the warrior. Those are archetypes. Those are easy, right? Those are things that recur over and over again. But the thing that I uh, wanted to talk about, and the archetype that I wanted to talk about specifically, was, and again I'm paraphrasing what Jung called the residual past, right? This primordial place that we all come from, right? And there's these different archetypes in the Jungian psychology, which uh, maybe you guys can help me with better than I can help them, honestly. Uh, I know that one of them is the anima and the animus. The other one is the self and... What's that? Uh, it and the ego, I think those are Freud, I think. Yeah. Uh, but the animus and the animus. The animus is uh, male. Anima is female, I believe. And then there's the self. And there's one I'm forgetting, right? But there are ways of discovering who we really are, right? There are ways where we uh, come up against ourselves. And so if you're looking at the anima and the animus in terms of poetry, I mean, how many of us deny our feminine side? Especially for Chicano, right? You like, stamp the macho thing. Right? Yeah. You, gotta, you gotta be the, the macho, right? But, if you're ever to achieve quality, if you're ever to find these homes and make them a reality, then it has to be inclusive of your female side too, I believe. Right? 
And it's uh, where that creativity comes, where you're juggling the two sides of yourself, if you will. Where you're trying to find your own, I think it's the self-conscious, right? And so I wanted to provide a couple of examples of what I think uh, depicts these four homes. And I, I picked some real uh, standard poets, right? Uh, by standard, I mean poets that you're probably familiar with, poets that I teach in my Chicano literature class. I'm going to start with Sandra Cisneros, probably her most famous poem, You Bring Out the Mexican in Me, right? And uh, I don't know that we can read the whole thing because it's a, it's a relatively long poem. But as I'm reading it to you, uh, oh, that didn't work. Over on the other side here. There they are. Spooky. <laughs> yeah, that's spooky. All right, no napping. <laughs> so this is you bring out the Mexican in me. Um, do I need to make it a little bit larger? Yes. Not a big deal. Is 180% enough or do we? Yes. All right. So you bring out the Mexican in me. You bring out the Mexican in me, the hunkered thick dark spiral, the core of a hard howl, the bitter bile, the tequila lagrimas on Saturday all through next week Sunday. You are the one I'd go to the other loves for, surrender my one woman house, allow red wine in bed, even with my vintage lace linens, maybe. Maybe for you. You bring out the Dolores del Rio in me, the Mexican spitfire in me, the Ra Navajas glint and passion in me, the raised cane and dance with the rooster footed devil in me, the spangled sequin in me, the eagle and serpent in me, the mariachi trumpets of the blood in me, the Aztec love of war in me, the fierce obsidian of the tongue in me, the Benin Chula Bien Cabrona in me, the Pandora's curiosity in me, the pre Columbian death and destruction in me. The rainforest disaster, nuclear threat in me. The fear of fascists in me. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You bring out the colonizer in me, the holocaust of desire in me, the Mexico City 85 earthquake in me, the Popocatapeto Ichquato in me, the tidal wave of recession in me, the Agustin Nara hopeless romantic in me, the Barbacoa Taquitos on Sunday in me, the cover the mirrors with cloth in me. And we'll read a little bit more, but. Uh, we're two or three stanzas in, and I think already we're touching on all those different homes, right? So I'm, I'm going to pitch it back to the audience as you're sitting out there in the dark, and I'll try and discern where the voices are coming from. Uh, but, I mean, some examples of the, of the cultural, just to which you've heard. The, 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 the taquitos, right? The food, right? The Agustin Lara, the music, and the... Uh, the tequila lagrimas, right? The language itself, right? And we, we move up. Any historical references? You know, the earthquake, of course, being one of them. Any others? The Holocaust. The Holocaust of desire in me. What's that? Pre-Columbian. The pre-Columbian colonizer in me. Huh? The, the fascist? The fascist? Yeah. The nuclear threat. Nuclear threat. Those are, those are markers for us, right? Those are ways that we determine how we understand this poem. It's one of the ways that we create meaning. Uh, and by we, I mean poets, but I mean us as readers as well, right? We, we understand that these things are sometimes in opposition to one another. And in that echo between those oppositions, we find ourselves constructing meaning. And I tell my students this all the time, it's, it's never the X or the Y, it's the echo. That's the poem, right? It's never the subject that you start writing about, and it's never the aha moment necessarily that the, that the reader gets from reading the poem. It's all those thoughts that rolled through their mind as they were reading. It's all the places the poem took us. That's the reason we come back to the poem. Because we want to experience those things again. So says me. Right? What about the, the mythical? The Popocatapetl, right? Yeah? I hope I said that right. Say that ten times fast. 
There was huh? something further up too. Yeah, I mean, um, if you scroll up, I don't remember exactly. Okay. Cain, yeah. right? Cain can, uh, in my home, that would be cultural, right? But in other homes, it might be considered the mythical. The right? rooster footed devil. Yeah. The rooster footed devil in me. The eagle, the eagle and serpent. serpent. There it is, right? That's our plume serpent. That's our Quetzalcoatl. Yeah. Okay? And then down here, we have the. Um, where is it? Oh, I, see, once you put me on the spot, I. The Pandora's. Yeah, Pandora's box, that's mythical. I was looking for the, because we have the Quetzalcoatl with the plume serpent, the eagle and serpent in me. Mm -hmm. Oh, the obsidian, oh. the fierce obsidian. Oh, so that's the, that's the other god, right? That's the Tezcatlipoca. And I told you, those two are kind of together all the time. Mm -hmm. right? And so, and I know this sounds kind of hokey and sort of cliche and whatever, but to me, these are the four chambers of, of the heart, right? They have to work in unison together in order to, well, make us alive, right? So that we can be alive. The same thing, at least in my opinion, holds true for the poem, that they have to work in unison. Uh, and not knowing enough about the heart to, enough to get myself in trouble anyway. Uh, but, you know, certain times, other parts of the heart work harder than other parts, right? And uh, one of the analogies I give my students, that's not a heart analogy, but it's a, it's a recipe analogy, right? Sometimes there's five cups of flour, but there's only one tablespoon of baking powder. Right? You need just a little bit of one, even if your poem is about five parts of the other, right? And one of the reasons I love this poem is because I think it's very balanced, right? It's three cups of everything. Right? Um, and then we'll just cruise along and look at a few more uh, stanzas. If you don't want. Everybody cool with that? Look at a few more stanzas. <clears throat> so here's the part where we get into the Jungian part, right? My sweet twin, my wicked other. I read this poem to my students, or I have them read it, and they think she's writing to a man. And I'm like, no, 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 she's writing to, she's writing to her sweet twin, her tokaya. It's one of her archetypes. It comes up over and over again in her book. Her books, I should say. Right? This sweet twin, this wicked other. You know? And uh, in a Woman Hollering Creek, there's a story called Mitokaya. I think it's, a, it might be in, uh, do you remember, Carol? It's in Woman Hollering Creek. Is it Woman Hollering yeah, Creek? Yeah, yeah Mitokaya, yeah. right? And she has this alternate other with the exact same name as her. And uh, the alternate other is very different than the persona that's on the page or than the person that's narrating the story to us. So, I am the memory that circles your bed nights. That's that Jungian collective unconsciousness, I think, that uh, I don't know enough about, but that's what the poem tugs you taut as moon tugs ocean. I claim you all mine. Arrogant as manifest destiny, I want to rattle and rent you in two. And it's that back and forth, that two-ness, if you will, not to steal from the boys, but I want to defile you and raise hell. I want to pull out the kitchen knives, dull and sharp, and whisk the air with crosses. Me sacas lo mexicana in me, like it or not. You bring out the ule nayel in me, the stand back white bitch in me, the switchblade in the boot in me, the Acapulco cliff diver in me, the flecha roja mountain disaster in me, the dengue fever in me, the alarma murderous in me. I could kill in the name of you and think it worth it. Brandish a fork and terrorize rivals, female and male, who loiter and look at you, languid in your light. Oh, I am evil. I am the filth god of lots of I am the swallower of sin, the lust goddess without guilt, the delicious debauchery. You bring out the primordial exquisiteness in me. That primordial is another Jungian thing. Right? 
corporal and venial sin in the original transgression. She uh, cruises on through here. She has the Virgen de Guadalupe immediately juxtaposed with the Quatnacute, fertility goddess. We have the filth goddess up above. We have the different uh, allusions to myrrh, saints, Quatnacute, Virgen de Guadalupe. Okay? And trying to make sense of all these different homes, trying to bring them all together in one poem. And in my mind, crossing seamlessly from one to the next, in and out. Right? And um, I don't know how many of you are, are here for you know, your own writing, but what I try and tell my students, because one of the poems I share with them every semester, is to be able to move seamlessly, because as we're reading, as we're writing, I should say, we're writing poems and or stories. And I think this happens just in everyday life, too. There's this thought that sneaks in, right? It says, why were you on the page? You know you want to. Put me on the page, come on, you know you want to. But then your third grade teacher comes back and says, stick to the main point. <laughs> right? And, and you ignore these other homes, right? So what I find most of my students doing, and this is not a, a knock on them, it's just something that I did too and still do sometimes, I find myself writing about the actual. I find myself writing about a breakup poem or reading a poem about a breakup. I find myself reading about a, a sick relative or a, a grandparent or something that they love or hate or, uh, or fear, right? And what we all come to literature for is a way to deal with those very same things because we've all experienced those same problems in our own lives. And for the beginning writer, most of them anyway, they don't provide us with the answers because they ignore those four homes, at least in my opinion. They're the ones that are trying to poke their way into the poem. They're the ones trying to say, you know you want me in this poem. You know I'm the most important part of this poem. But for whatever reason, just like my earlier analogy when we look in the mirror, we tend to ignore that part of ourselves. That's a spooky, spooky place to be. For me, anyway. Right? And it's that spookiness that sometimes turns us uh, into just writing and thinking that the world is just that actual. Any questions before we look at a few other poems? Or I mean, uh, are we good? Am I basically making sense? Yeah? That's my refrain, by the way. I say that in all my classes. Am I making sense? And they always nod their head yes, even though I know that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but are we good? Yes? yes. Right. So let's, um, I'm going to, I don't want to skip the Cisnanus poem. It's a beautiful poem. But um, here's a Lorna de Cervantes poem. Okay. Uh, perhaps a similar tone to the Cisneros, right? Uh, I love the title, too, by the way. <laughs> Poem for the young white man who asked me how I, an intelligent, well-read person, could believe in the war between races. In my land, there are no distinctions. The barbed wire politics of oppression have been torn down long ago, the only reminder of past battles, lost or won, is a slight rutting in the fertile fields. In my land, people write poems about love, full of nothing but contented childlike syllables. Everyone reads Russian short stories and weeps. There are no boundaries, there is no hunger, no complicated famine or greed. I'm not a revolutionary. I don't even like political poems. Do you think I can believe in a war between races? I can deny it. I can forget about it when I'm safe, living on my own continent of harmony and home. But I am not there. I believe in revolution because everywhere the crosses are burning, sharp shooting goose steppers around every corner. There are snipers in the schools. I know you don't believe this. You think this is nothing but faddish exaggeration, but they are not shooting at you. 
I'm marked by the color of my skin. The bullets are discreet and designed to kill slowly. They are aiming at my children. These are facts. Let me show you my wounds, my stumbling mind, my, excuse me, tongue, and this nagging preoccupation with the feeling of not being good enough. These bullets bury deeper than logic. Racism is not intellectual. I cannot reason these scars away. Outside my door, there is a real enemy who hates me. I am a poet who yearns to dance on rooftops, to whisper delicate lines about joy and the blessings of human understanding. I try. I go to my land, my tower of words, and bolt the door, but the typewriter doesn't fade out. The sounds of blasting and muffled outrage, my own days bring me slaps on the face. Every day I am deluged with reminders that this is not my land. And this is my land. I do not believe in the war between races, but in this country, there is war. So that one's a little bit more subtle, right? It's not as obvious, right? And this one perhaps doesn't delve into the cultural by talking about taquitos, by talking about language, or using Spanish words necessarily. This one is about the loss of language. This is about the excuse me tongue. This is about what's lost and what needs to be defended. Right? And we look at the historical and, you know, again, some subtle examples of that. Can you guys remember any from the poem about the, what might be deemed historical? Goose-stepping. The goose-stepping. Any others? Excuse me? I can't remember. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Scroll, scroll, up. scroll up, scroll up. Remind, remind. Well, to me, the historical is one of the overarching themes of the poem, and it's the loss of land. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, not to steal the line from Cisneros, like it or not, right. I'm speaking for myself here, my parents never read me uh, Humpty Dumpty or Little Red Riding Hood or any of those things. I know this is an old running joke because I make it all the time, but it's true, they didn't. And, and my dad would tell me these stories about who the land used to belong to and how it was stolen. And I'm thinking, you know, and as a kid I'm like, oh, oh, oh. And they, they give you this gift of bitterness with the same tenderness they would give you a kiss. <laughs> right? Because because they know that that anger and that bitterness will someday come in handy. They know that it will protect you from unforeseen uh, arrows of racism and unforeseen tragedies of uh, being marginalized and left out. You don't even know this stuff when you're a kid. And your parents are instinctively teaching you this by telling you about land loss. It becomes your history. Language loss, it becomes your history. Right? And I think that's one of the things that uh, Cisneros touches upon quite nicely in my land. I love that pronoun, my land. Right? Because she makes a very clear distinction between that and the young white man who lives in a different land. And it's the very same land that we all share, which to me is interesting. And some of us in this audience identify with land A, and some of us in this audience identify with land B. But because I think this poem is effective, each one of us, I would hope, understands what it's like to be separated from those four homes by all sorts of different circumstances, by all sorts of different forces. Um, so anyway, I scrolled up for you guys. Uh, and then I answered my own question, which probably wasn't a good thing to do. Uh, but um, I think one of the reasons I love Lorna B. Cervantes so much, at least uh, this particular poem, and all of Empumada for that matter, is because she challenges some of the archetypes. She is challenging and trying to change the archetype. 
very much a feminist, in my opinion. Uh, very much in touch with creating a new mythology, with creating a new archetype. And when I say creating a new mythology, she just rereads this inherited knowledge that the woman needs to be uh, at, the, at the back of the room while the man does all the work. Right? She says, no, this is my land. I'm, I'm up front about these things. And she rereads that inherited knowledge. And she reimagines the hero as somebody who's not male. She reimagines the hero as somebody who's female. Right? And that's one of the things I love about the Cisneros poem, too, is she mentions all these female goddesses. Right? And she gives the male goddesses, I mean, male gods their time as well. Right? So, um, any questions thus far? I mean, clear as mud? Yeah. So what's the mythical in this one? Um, well, I was trying to point out that the mythical is that she is hero, right? That the eye speaker is this different sort of hero, that it's a female hero, right? Uh, is it like explicitly written into the poem? Not so much as it is in the Cisneros, right? Um, let's scroll down. If, What's if up? You, if you consider mythical rather than mythological, couldn't the first stanza be representation of mythical? Yeah, and I, in my land there are no distinctions. Well, that's certainly false. <laughs> Hardwired <laughs> politics of oppression torn down long ago. That's a myth. Yeah. So, not not mythological, but, but yeah, still mythical, mythical, right? Rereading inherited knowledge, changing the way that we view different things. Because we've all been given an inheritance of how things should be. And I think we all know that those things are oftentimes detrimental to a vast majority of the population, honestly. So to reread those inherited knowledges, or knowledge I should say, uh, is one of the poet's jobs. Right? To create a different home or remind us of another home. Uh, obviously, we've been talking a little bit about Cisneros. Uh, I've alluded to uh, Woman Hollering Creek already. But the house on Mongo Street, one of the themes in that is to build a house of her own. Right? Not a man's house, not a daddy's house. A place all my own, pretty as purple petunias. A place where I can go. A place quiet as the page before the poem, or something like that, right? Not an apartment, not a flat, not a daddy's house, a house all my own. So when I'm talking about, uh, you know, in the lecture title, the poet's responsibility, if these homes don't exist, if they've already been effaced to the point where you can't even recognize them, and if they've been diminished so that people don't even acknowledge that they're worthy, then you must, you being the poet, construct a separate home. Right? And that's when you read uh, Chicano <coughs> literature or ethnic and minority literature and the importance of home, and the importance of homing in, of finding that place where you belong. And if that place doesn't exist, then you dip back into your culture, you dip back into your history, dip back into your myths, you dip back into these archetypes and you construct a new and different and presumably a better one. I would argue a better one. Other questions? Or comments? All good. Yes, sir? Does it seem like there, that first poem in Cisneros was, uh, it was real easy to identify the, the different types of the way it was, but in this one, it's harder to identify, maybe. It's, and it's, uh, is that, um, it's kind of like a mirror image or, or a different way of writing, I guess, uh, just showing the different uh, four types. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I agree, this one is way more subtle. I think this one has a different tact altogether in what it's trying to accomplish. 
Um, and the disservice I've done to this poem is I've extracted it from all its companion poems in the book. And by extracting it from all these other poems, uh, this theme is, you know, not as evident, having not read the other 30 or so poems that come with it. Right? Um, but to me, um, it definitely touches on these two for sure. This one, you know, we can argue that it's in there or not in there. But this one, I think, is just kind of trying to change the archetype, mm -hmm. trying to subvert it. You know? But it doesn't use them specifically the way the Cisneros point. Um, I wanted to share one of the poems I wrote, uh, my most recent poem, or if everybody's okay with that, and yeah. so you can see how maybe those things work in my own poem. Um, I don't think anybody in this room's heard it. I don't think. Uh, I have read it once before in Crestone, of all places. Um, and it's a little bit long. Let me make it larger so you guys can read along. But uh, obviously it's titled The Elk Calf, and I won't get into too much detail because I think the poem is self-explanatory. Um, but again, I've gotten to a point in my own writing where I don't even think about these things. I think they just come out instinctively. Right? So anyway, the elk calf. I'm looking for scattered sheep in the wilderness. The herder has fallen ill. I am on foot. The horse is in the wind. The horse is smoke. The horse is pollen. The horse is ghost. And the dogs have no loyalty to me. I am walking the meadows of Rincón Bonito. The old man called the spruce at the meadow's edge Los Brazos. Translated, the name means arms, but the ancient meaning is shadow and silence. I must enter the spruce. My abuelito's voice tells me I must get the count. We must know how many have died, how many will not return to the Anos south of home. We must know how much of our winter work has been lost here in this late June. I will not find every sheep. It has been too long. <coughs> The herd are sick for five days. I am only 11. But I know what death is. I have seen the violence of what dogs can do, the neck wounds that only coyotes make. I imagine the calf, female, weigh her with my eyes. 40 pounds, I tell myself. The clearing is small, no grass, small bits of bark, twigs dark as morning dark, spruce needles, the gold of dying things, cling to the still wet animal, her amniotic sac, a yellow shawl on her shoulders, ears wet, the placenta in cord at her nose. I pray to God, silently, that I am allowed to witness this. Pray that the cow elk is only at the spruce edge of the forest, her large and sleek body somehow brought into the safety of a shadow human eyes cannot penetrate. I pray because that is what my abuelita has taught me to do. Pray that my being here, this accident, will not mean the death of this animal. I dare not touch, but my touch will do for having touched. As a man, I carry this anger. It is untraceable. Yet I know my father taught it to me with his blood, with his stories. He loved all of us enough to teach us not to trust. Even so, his eyes have in them the dark well of mercy. This vine of flower is watered by fire, and it is my life. Beyond the newborn elk calf, the spruce drop down a slight slope. Light enters in razors of dust, pillars of gold. At the edge of the clearing there are six sheep buried in the duff, their bodies bloated, bellies green and blue, necks broken. I am eleven. The horses in the wind and the dogs have no loyalty. There are two ravens at the edge of the trees. The invisible magpies are crying into the day. I look back toward the elk calf. I do not know what to do. I am alone. I pray, because that is what I have been taught to do. I pray for myself. I pray for the count. And perhaps I pray that too much death will not enter into my life. I must have prayed for something like that. Oh dear and brutal day, 
Do not seep into my young heart. Dear Lord and dear St. Francis, look over the newborn elf calf. May her mother hear her chirp. May her mother lift her head and run toward the sound. And may all living things that have not yet done so. Dear Lord, may they suffer. O oh, dear and brutal day, whose light is pillars through dark arms of spruce, may the horse return to camp, and may the dogs always be loyal. O oh, dear and brutal day, here where I stand at the edge of death and birth, protect me. O oh, small voice that was me a thousand years ago, tell me which way the bear has gone, and lead me away towards safety and living sheep. Small voice that was me so long ago, let me sing later, let me not know too much anger. Let me sing of forgiveness. Remind me, oh small voice, that my father has sent me here alone because he loves me and understands that men must know their fear if they are ever to love. Dear and brutal day, heal the herder and lead the horse home. Lead to the mother elk to her calf. Lead her to lick the newborn clean. Lead her to eat placenta in cord, lead her to swallow the danger the scent of these things brings. My abuelita has taught me to pray. She tells me our faith is made of three pillars, prayer, penance, and action, that there are eight types of literature in the Bible. This is one of them. She has taught me to pray. I would give away most anything to hear her voice again. I would give away words and anger I would give away fear and joy. I would give away this abyss between life and death. I would give away this spruce and every wilderness to have her lead me in prayer just one more time. I am just a boy. She died the winter before. I asked her to ask God to save the elk calf I did not dare touch. I asked her to walk me back to the open meadow, and I asked that the count not grow too high or too heavy for my young body to bear. So anyway, thank you for that. Um, Reminds me of a story. And I don't know, I hope and it's going to be on film, but I'll tell it anyway. Uh, <laughs> my wife and I went to this awards bank, but I, will, I won't say where, but it was for uh, students getting scholarships. And this man comes up on the stage, and he's going to introduce the keynote speaker. So when he comes up on the stage, everybody starts clapping. He goes, whoa, 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 before you give me the clap, give her the clap. And then, <laughs> oops, right? Oops. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. so, so that's you know, a poem I wrote fairly recently, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, something like that. And it's like the second time I've ever read it. But I was instinctively juggling all these things, you know, not doing it intentionally, not even thinking about it anymore. But to me, uh, they find their way into almost everything I write somehow. Uh, I don't know if it's training, I don't know if it's reading, if it's training and reading, I don't know if it's something that's just inherited in my DNA. But you know, I, I look at other writers that I admire, whether they're uh, writers of color or not, and I find so many of them touching on all these different uh, facets. Uh, you know, and again, it's not in a poem, at least I can't remember being a poem, but T.S. Eliot, right? The furthest thing from a Chicano ever, right? <laughs> uh, you know, he's talking about uh, this place in the human mind, and he goes, I'm paraphrasing, but it's only accessible to and through poets. Which is pretty cool, right? And what is that place in our human mind? Right? I, I think it's the echo of these, of these homes, of these places, that are in each and every single one of us, even if we've been removed from them for generations, even if we've never known them in our own lifetime. I think they're really distinct parts of who we are as human beings. And uh, that's what I love about poetry, that's what I love about literature is it helps us discover who we are. It's a really, really uh, painful yet beautiful mirror that we hold up every time we write something or read something. And uh, so to me, the mirror shows me those four homes over and over and over again. 
and then I write what I see. So, anyway, uh, there's questions about the poem, but there's other questions about those four homes of poetry, and what I think the writer's or the poet's responsibility to those is, or any question at all, you know, I'm 5'10", 43, uh, whatever, I mean, you answer them you know, before you ask them. Uh, I weigh too much. Yeah. Yeah. Marty? Aaron, uh, I just have a question on your poem here about the mythical or mythological. I'm, I'm trying to see where that poem is in this poem. And I can see the other three pretty clearly. Yeah. But I don't, I, I, I think I'm just not. No, I mean, it's it, cognizant of. Yeah, and, and again, it's a bit of a cop out, right? But I, I mentioned earlier, it's a recipe, right? I mean, there's five cups of flour, but only a pinch of salt, yes, for yes, example. Right. Um, so, to me, um, this is very light on the mythical, honestly. Uh, to me, this is like the the mythical of a wilderness, okay. the mythical of being lost, the mythical of being. Uh, and it's very close to the religious too, right? I was kind of playing with the lost in the wilderness right. theme a little bit. Do the, so. do the brazos kind of go with the mythical in terms of you think well, of those the, arms? When I, see the, the, when I see the brazos, to this day, right? Because I, I, they sent me into the trees. Uh, and again, I had family around. They would have found my body had the bear gotten to me. But the sheep were everywhere, right? So they dropped me off. And they say, walk from Rincon Bonito and walk up to the, uh, to the ridge. But I got to walk through these trees. And to this day, I'm just terrified. Right? It's the, it's the boogeyman, those trees, to me. Right? So that wilderness is the only place I sort of put a pinch of the mythical in the, the Brazos. Yeah. I thought the mythical was the animal. Uh, the bear, and then you start thinking, you know, all the, the elk, the elk cat, they have a spirit and they're, they're part of nature, but it's a mythical spirit to look at the American Indian, yeah. Native American. And, and then they're part of that wilderness too, right? They're kind of inseparable from that wilderness. Uh, and it's a true story, right? I, I walk through the clearing, I smell the sheep before I see them. And I see this pile, there's six of them, and, and all of them with their necks broken, and the bear had just piled them up and was like, I'm going to eat those later. <laughs> I'm positive that's what the bear had said. Yeah. And I'm standing there and I'm like, there's a little calf behind me. I know the bear could probably smell that. She could definitely smell these sheep. I, I cannot run the bear. I'm screwed. And I, I was like, which way do I go? And I, I seriously, it's like a true story. And I just, Ave Maria Purissimo, Ave Maria Purissimo. Over and over and over and over again. And, uh, Anyway, I'm alive. <laughs> it was alive. Thanks. It really evoked for me that kind of a coming of age of you know the things that you've been taught, you know what you're doing, you're having to make decisions, you don't want to make those decisions, you want your grandmother back there. It really evokes that feeling of crossing over into a different kind of place in life that you're not sure you want to go. Um, I, I really got that. Thank sense. you. And, and it's to, not to you know, talk about myself, but that's what I was trying to go for, right? This back and forth you know, between childhood, between life and death, between yeah. birth and death, between, between uh, decay. Uh, is that elk calf just as lost as I am? Those things. It's without its parents. I'm without my parents. Uh, so yeah, I'm moving back and forth between those things quite intentionally. I really felt it. I mean, it really evoked that feeling of being on that. Well, thank you. Other comments or questions? Yeah. Well, I know it's just probably a matter of how to how to name things, but earlier you said that um, for you the uh, religious references were cultural, but I feel like at least in this poem they're mythical when you bring in Saint Francis and um, Mary and even your Abelita and, and God. It feels like that is what places. The experience in the middle of this um, crossroads. Okay. And, and I, I do think that for a lot of people, those are interchangeable, right? The, the mythical and the religious. Mm -hmm. 
And people view those things as mythical. And they feel mythical often, even to me. Right? Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I intend them to be cultural, which they are to me, but I understand that they feel and act mythical as well in, in the poems. I don't know if I'm an introvert. Well, they're, are they cultural because you're choosing the, yeah, I guess it's the, the choice. mythos of your religion? Yeah. Um, and when you choose the mythos of um, the Aztec religion, you're saying, oh, no, that's not quite. Yeah, because I didn't grow up with it, right? It but wasn't ingrained in me. They're really, to me, they're all. Um, yeah. And I'm just that's learning cool. about one you know, through books and through uh, study. And the other one was taught to me without me even having to think about it. Yeah. Uh, but actually, yeah, gods and goddesses, saints and Virgen de Guadalupe, etc. Those things are well, like myths, yeah. But to me, they're just part of who I am. So that's why I identify them as cultural. Um, you mentioned the word Chicano in terms of the Pachuco riots <coughs> and the trial, and I need to correct you. Um, it's a word that didn't come into being until the earlier mid-60s, and the word has, at least for culture, uh, self-determination meaning. And so that when you think about that trial in the early 40s, yeah. and the naval base like uh, soldiers and the community right next to it in this war that went on, you know, they would have been called probably dirty Mexicans, or maybe in a polite way, Mexican Americans. And still, that would have been demeaning in some ways, in terms of that, you know, it was white America against this old country of its people being in the wrong place, in America, as opposed to being in Mexico. Yeah. There's also that that's going on there. No, and then there's the evolution of the word Chicano in like this valley where, you know, people thought of themselves as Spanish. Still do. <laughs> and then it evolved to something else. You know, with some continuing themselves Chicano, but not a lot of the elders not. Well, my, my reference was just the character of Pachuco. Right. right. Yeah. I understood that. Yeah. And then uh, how they identified was just some of the terms that, you know, your Henry Reynas and talking uh, about. I got you. You're, you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I found a couple of those lines that uh, you said very really fascinating. That's, and I'm paraphrasing, a man must learn fear if he is ever to love. And I'm trying to place that in here now. I have, I'm just paraphrasing. Yeah, it's up there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was something his father taught him. Mm -hmm. So my father has sent me here alone because he loves me and understands that men must know their fear if they are ever to love. So says me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, could you just tell us, in your opinion, what the overarching poem is for this particular poem? Is there one that's, that's overarching and seems to be most important to you? or? Um, it's that echo, which I alluded to earlier, between life and death, between being a boy and being a man. So the archetype of coming of age. Yeah, the Bildungsroman, if you will. Yeah, the coming of age. Sorry, Aaron, but I, I told no? the theater I can't take a picture of their play. Oh, that's fine. Thank you for coming. Yes, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. But yeah, this, uh, this is one of those, uh, quite literally, the small voice. And I was like, that doesn't belong in the poem. But it's like, yeah, I do. <laughs> so I wrote it in. And uh, I, I think it's true, but it just didn't seem to fit. The other one is the part where um, I'd say that my dad taught me bitterness or anger or something. That particular stanza. Uh, not to trust. And uh, for whatever reason, those needed to find their way into the poem. And, and, they, and they did. And I put them in, obviously. 
But I guess I, I, I don't think you're asking me to explain why I think that's true. But um, you know, I, I I think for me, I'm afraid to lose everything I love. Right? And if uh, I didn't fear those things, I wouldn't cling to them so much. I wouldn't love them as dearly as I do. And, uh, I think I learned that pretty young, actually. And I, I think I learned it from my dad, I think. <laughs> pretty sure I did. Other comments or questions or corrections? Yeah, Ted? I have a comment. I, I've been to many presentations in this room by faculty, and this was one of the very best I've ever heard. Thanks. It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's thank Aaron. Thank you. Can you take some fruit and cookies on your way out? Please take. Because they're all going to go to waste. So please take that. And again, if you want to sign up, uh, got this here, and then flyers for Maddie's talk. Thanks.